What's going on guys? My name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $1250 and for that price you're getting a very powerful system that can not only game but also stream and video edit with ease. This is actually the highest budget for a build guide I've ever done and this video just like the last few is going to be a full PC build guide. I'm not only going to be showing you each of the parts and explaining why I picked them but I'm also going to be showing you how to put everything together step by step and show you all the drivers and software you need and find Finally, I'm going to show you how the system performs in a number of different games and in streaming. Also, as a bonus for those of you who want to overclock their CPU, I'll also be showing you OC settings so you can get the max performance possible out of your PC. This video is in partnership with Micro Center, who is the one-stop shop for all of your work and learn from home tech needs. They offer by far the best in-person experience for buying PC parts, and while I did go off of pricing from Amazon and Newegg, buying these parts in stores at Micro Center would save you a good amount of money through combo deals and other discounts. They also now offer a custom PC builder which helps you spec and budget out your system using parts that they have in stock and ready to be purchased. Check the links in the description to find a micro center near you and to check out not only the new PC builder but also their new build showcase area where you can see other PC builds and show off your own. So now getting back to the PC in this video, like I said before this system is a gaming beast. It's perfect for competitive gaming in 1440p at high refresh rates. For example, COD Warzone plays at 1440p high at well over 100 FPS average, and Fortnite plays at 1440p pro settings with an average in the mid 200s. Beyond just gaming, this system can also stream to sites like Twitch really well. It's also a great system for those wanting to get into video editing, and if this is something you're interested in, then I'll be offering some suggestions on how to tweak your system for editing. As I'm sure many of you know, PC Pro inventory is kind of all over the place right now. The vast majority of parts shown in this video can be purchased today for the prices I paid, but if any parts have gone out of stock or have had major price increases, then I'll leave links to alternative parts in the description below. These alternatives will be of the same quality as the originals and will still allow you to follow along with this guide in the video. This video will be broken up into a few main parts. I'll start with the part selection and explanations where I'll tell you about what parts I picked and why I picked them. Then I'll go into the build guide section where I'll show you how to put this exact set of parts together step by step. I'll then show you all the software, drivers, and BIOS tweaks you need. Then finally, I'll show you the system's performance and give you my final thoughts on the build. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into each of the parts that make up this $1,250 gaming beast. Let's start by talking about the CPU. I knew I was going to go AMD for this build, but I had two CPUs in mind that I had a tough time deciding between. These are the 6-core Ryzen 5 3600 and then 8-core Ryzen 7 3700X. There is an argument to be made about going for the 8-core CPU, but when you look at benchmarks, especially for gaming, the Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 perform almost identically in gaming, and saving the money by going for the 3600 means that extra money can be saved and used in other areas like the GPU for more gaming performance. Like I said before, the Ryzen 5 3600 is a 6-core CPU and it also has hyper-threading. The 3600 is on AMD's latest Zen 2 architecture and can turbo well above 4 GHz. 6 cores and 12 threads is perfect for gaming and also gives you enough multi-threaded performance for streaming to sites like Twitch and for video editing even in 4K resolution. With this being said, if you are very serious about video editing, opting for the 3700X may be the better option, but it will cost a bit more. For the current going rate of around $160, this is, in my opinion, the absolute best value for the money CPU on the market. Stock performance is great, but this chip is unlocked, meaning it can be overclocked, and I'll be showing you the settings I use to overclock this guy for those who are wanting to get the absolute max performance out of their system. All in all, the Ryzen 5 3600 worked great in this PC, and I have absolutely no problem recommending it. To cool our CPU, I would normally just use the stock cooler because it's free and is adequate in most use cases, but for this build, I decided to up the ante a bit by going with an aftermarket cooler. This is the Deepcool Gamex GT ARGB, which for around $45 is a great deal. It has four direct contact heat pipes and a pretty large aluminum fin array. Performance on this guy is great and it also looks amazing in my opinion. Not only does it have RGB on the included 120mm fan, but it also has it on the top of the heatsink, both of which which can be synced with the rest of the lighting in this build. Using a big cooler like this also allowed me to get a pretty high overclock while still maintaining low temps and low noise levels. Now let's move on to the motherboard. If you watched the channel before, then you may know that my favorite AM4 motherboard is 
the ASRock B450 M Pro 4, which is an insane value for the money. But for a higher end build like this, I needed something a bit more premium, which is why I went with the new ASRock B550 M Pro 4, which improves upon the B450 version in a lot of ways. This board comes in at around $115, and for that price you're getting a whack ton of features. These include 4 DIMM slots, 3 M.2 slots, one of which is for M.2 Wi-Fi, 3 PCIe slots, an M.2 heatsink, and a decent VRM setup. I also like the looks of this board a lot. The color scheme is pretty neutral, meaning it could fit in a ton of different builds and still look nice. This is an MATX board used in an ATX case, but it looks fine in my opinion, and this board worked perfectly supporting all the parts and allowed for a pretty high overclock on the CPU. Overall, the B550M Pro 4 is a great value for the money board, and this will certainly not be the last time I use it. Next, let's move on to RAM. This is an area where special attention needs to be paid because Ryzen CPUs are heavily affected per performance wise by the clock speed of the RAM being used. Because of this I went with what is pretty much the de facto standard for mid to high end builds which is this 16GB kit of G-Skill RipJaws 5 DDR4 memory. This is 3600MHz RAM which is perfect for our Ryzen CPU and timings are still decent with this being a CL16 kit. This is very much a no frills kit of RAM but again performance is amazing and the $75 sticker price makes it a great value for the money. Also these have an all black design meaning they blend in very very well. All in all, this is probably my favorite kit of memory for Ryzen systems and I've never had any problems with the many kits of this that I've used in the past. For storage, I decided to go all SSD and more specifically NVMe. What I went with is this crucial P1 M.2 SSD with 1TB of capacity. This is a good mid-range NVMe SSD that provides a lot of performance and is DRAM making it great for a boot drive. 1TB of storage is plenty for your OS, applications, and a number of different games, but if you're wanting to hold a ton of games on your system, going with a 500GB SSD in combination with a 2TB hard drive might not be a bad idea and would be similar in price. With this being said, I personally wouldn't need more than 1TB of space if I didn't video edit, and I think for the vast majority of people 1TB would work fine, especially for just starting out because storage can always be easily upgraded in the future. Now let's talk about the GPU. With the system this high end, it really only made sense to go for an Nvidia card. The 2080 Super was a little too high for this budget, so what I went with is the RTX 2070 Super, which is a beast of a gaming card and is perfect for 1440p and even some 4K gaming. This is the EVGA XE Ultra model, which is a pretty awesome implementation of this GPU. This features a dual fan design with a very beefy heatsink and a very substantial metal backplate. I like the looks of this card a lot, and its neutral black and grey color scheme matches perfectly with the build. As you'll see in the benchmarks, this card performs great and also has a few tricks up its sleeve for certain computing tasks. Firstly, it has the RTX cores which enable it to use ray tracing in the titles that support it, and it has the NVIDIA NVENC encoder. This NVENC encoder is perfect for people who are wanting to stream gameplay to sites like Twitch because it takes a lot of the stream off the CPU and has a negligible effect on GPU performance. Overall, this 2070 Super worked great in this build and I have no problem recommending it for your next PC build. Let's now talk about the power supply. These are the hardest hit inventory and price wise right now. What I went with is the EVGA 650G+. This is a 650 watt 80 plus gold modular power supply. I don't think this unit is currently available, so I'll link a few alternatives in the description. Basically, you want to get a 600 watt or more 80 plus gold unit from a reputable manufacturer like EVGA or Corsair. 650 watts is way more than enough for the system, and the modular cable design makes cable management a breeze. But even if you get a non-modular unit, it will be fine because all the cables will be hidden in the power supply basement of our case. Speaking of the case, let's talk about what all of these parts are going into. This is the Deepcool Matrix 50. This is the version that comes with three RGB fans included, and for around $70, this is a great deal. This is an ATX case that is super easy to work in. It has front and side tempered glass panels, and plenty of room in the back for cable management. One feature I like a lot is the fact you have the option to control the RGB from the case itself. 
The built-in RGB controller has a bunch of different color options and means there's no need to run any sort of RGB software that could take up background resources. Overall, for $1250, the system's providing a ton of reliable and high quality parts that should last you for years to come. Everything in here is very well balanced and as you'll be able to see later, performance on the sky is great. So now that you've seen each of the parts and learned about why I picked them, it's now time to show you how to put everything together step by step. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble the system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you'll really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver for the M.2 screw. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver. This will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. Next, let's talk about static. I personally don't worry about it and have never had any issues or problems with it. If you live in a very dry place, or are worried about it, you can use an anti-static ground strap like this one or periodically ground yourself on something like a light switch screw. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. So the first thing you're going to want to get out is your motherboard box. Open it up and grab out the manual, the IO shield, and the motherboard itself. Take the motherboard out of the bag, close the box, and place the board on top of it. Bring your attention to the center of the board, press down and out on this metal lever, then lift it up until it's perpendicular perpendicular with the board. Now get out your CPU, handling it only by the edges. Find the marked corner of the CPU and the marked corner of the motherboard and line up the two. You can also line up the Ryzen 5 3600 text with the socket AM4 text on the motherboard. Once lined up, lower it down applying no pressure, it should just slot in this place. Once down, lower the CPU retention arm back down making sure it clips into place. Now to get our board ready for our cooler, remove these four screws, these two plastic pieces, and the back plate from the board. You can store these in the motherboard box in case you need to use them in the future. Get the accessory bag out of the cooler box, take the four long bolts and put one in each of the back plate holes like this. They should kind of lock into place. When done, your back plate should look like this. Now put the back plate on the back of the motherboard, pushing the four bolts through the holes. Now get out four of these tall nuts and four of these washers. For each bolt, first put a washer over it, then screw on a nut until it's tightened down. Do the same thing for all four bolts. Next, grab the two larger brackets and the cooler itself. Take one of the two small screws and install the first bracket like this with the bracket in this orientation. To install the other bracket, you need to first remove the fan by pulling off these metal retention dabs. Once off, install the bracket just like the other one. Now it's time to attach the heatsink to the motherboard. First, peel off this protective plastic on the bottom of the cooler. Next, moving back to the motherboard, take the included thermal paste and squeeze a pea-sized amount on the center of the CPU IHS. Now, lower the cooler down with the wire side facing the RAM slots like this and make sure the bolts from the back plate slip through the bracket holes. Next, attach a spring-loaded screw on each of the bolts and tighten them down in a cross pattern to ensure even pressure across the CPU. Once tightened down, you can reinstall the fan by placing it how you want and slipping the metal clips over the heatsink like this on both sides. Next, take the 4-pin fan cable and find the CPU fan header here. Line the notch in the slot and connector and press it into place. Leave the RGB cables alone for now. Next, let's install our RAM. We'll be putting our RAM sticks in slots 2 and 4 to ensure dual channel operation. Open up the clips on both slots, get out your first stick and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it down. Once you're sure it's incorrectly, press down until both sides click and the clip closes shut. Now just repeat the same process for the second stick. Now it's time to install the M.2 SSD. Begin by getting out your small screwdriver and unscrewing the two screws on the M.2 heatsink and lift it away. Take your M.2 SSD and line the notch in the slot and the connector and insert it at a 45 degree angle. After removing the plastic on the back of the M.2 heatsink, lower the SSD down then place the heatsink on top lining up the holes. Now just reinstall the two screws we took out earlier. With this done, you can put the motherboard aside and bring your attention to the case. Take the case out of the box and out of the plastic. Begin by loosening the top and bottom thumb screws on the back panel, then pull on the center handle and lift the panel away. Now with the case on its side, unscrew the four thumb screws and then lift the glass panel away. Place the foam, plastic, and both of the side panels in the box. This gets them out of the way and prevents them from getting damaged. Next, take the IO shield that looks like this and orient it like this, making sure the silver foam is towards the inside of the case. Line it up with the back IO cutout and press all four corners 
in until they're secured. With that done, grab two standoffs that look like this from the screw bag that came in the case, hand tighten one here and one in here. These are necessary because we're using a micro ATX board. Now you can take your motherboard, handling it by the cooler and lower it into the case, lining up the IO with the IO shield and making sure you can see the standoffs through the holes in the motherboard. Now get out eight motherboard screws that look like this. Install one in each of the holes of the motherboard using your screwdriver. Now if you have a non-modular power supply, you can skip this part, but if you do, then you need to install the 24 pin motherboard cable, the 8 pin CPU cable, two VGA cables, and a SATA cable that looks like this, which I originally forgot to put in and had to put in later, so you should do it now. To make room for the power supply, loosen these four screws and slide this drive cage all the way to the front of the case. If your power supply is extra long, then you can remove this cage altogether as we don't need it for this build. Now slide your power supply into place like this and using the four screws that came with it, screw the unit into the back of the case. Now time to start routing cables. Take the 24 pin cable that looks like this and route it through here. Take the two PCIe cables and route them through the hole in the center of the power supply basement like this. Take the USB 3 cable and route it through the same hole as the 24 pin cable. Take the HD audio cable and route it through here. Take the USB 2 cable and the front panel connectors that look like this and route them through this hole here. Now take the fan splitter that looks like this and unbundle it. Grab the three three pin fan cables towards the front of the case and plug them into the splitter one at a time. Now take the four pin end of the fan splitter and push it through this hole here. Next, take the 8-pin CPU cable and push it through this hole here. Then finally, take the two RGB cables from the cooler and push them to the back of the case through this hole here. Now, take the two RGB cables from the cooler and plug them into two of the open slots on the RGB connectors from the front panel. Now take the SATA power cable and plug it into the SATA connector which powers the LED lights. Now with the case on its side, take the 4 pin connector at the end of the fan splitter and plug it into the connector above where we plugged in the CPU fan. Next take the 8 pin CPU power cable at the top left of the board and line the notch in the slot with the notch in the header and press it into place. Now for the 24 pin, line up the two notches and press down until it clips in. The USB 3 plugs in below the 24 pin, it only goes in one way by lining up the cut out in the header and the bump out in the cable. Next at the bottom left of the board, take the HD audio with the text facing the top of the case and press it down. Now take the USB 2 cable and insert it into the header with the USB text facing down. Now for the front panel connectors, take the one labeled power switch and plug it in on the top right two pins like this. Take the power switch cable with the positive to the left and plug them in directly next to the power button. Now take the hard drive LED and plug it in directly below the power LED cable like this, making sure the positive is to the left. Now we can move on to installing our graphics card. Begin by unscrewing and removing the panel here. Next, unscrew and lift away this PCIe cover. Now bend this PCIe cover back and forth until it snaps off, making sure not to drag it across any of the motherboard surface mounted components. Now click open the PCIe lock and lower your GPU down, lining up the back with the back IO cutouts and the notch in the card with the notch in the slot. Once lowered down, you can press it into place until the PCIe lock snaps shut. Next, install one or two screws in the graphics card I.O. bracket and replace the case cover you took off earlier. Now install the two PCIe cables into the graphics card lining the notch in the connectors with the notch in the slots and pressing them into place. The final thing to do is use the included zip ties to cable manage. Pull the excess cable length from the main chamber to the back and secure the wires down. This is optional but highly recommended. With this done, you can pop back on your side panels because it's now time to boot the system up for the first time. Before you get into games, you're going to need to do a few things on the software side of things. The first thing to do is install Windows. I'm not going to go over that process in this video, but I'll leave a link to a guide on how to do this in the description below. With that done, you can boot into Windows to install some drivers. First, head to the NVIDIA drivers page linked in the description. Select RTX 2070 Super and Windows 10 64-bit from the drop-down menus and press search to find the latest graphics card drivers. Download these and install them. Next we need our chipset drivers and our motherboard. Head to the motherboard page linked in the description. Press support, then download, then download and install the AMD chipset drivers. With this done, there is one more thing to do before jumping into games, which needs to be done in the BIOS. With your PC turned off, press the on button and then immediately mash the delete key until you enter into the BIOS. You need to go over to the OC tweaker, then go down to load XMP settings. Press auto and change it to XMP 2.0 profile 1. Next, let's talk about CPU overclocking. 
If you're not interested in this, then go ahead and just save changes and exit. If you are, scroll back up to CPU frequency and voltage change, select this and change it to manual. A pretty much guaranteed overclock would be 4200 megahertz, which is 4.2 gigahertz at 1.325 volts. I ended up settling on 4300 MHz at 1.3 volts, which you can try but isn't guaranteed to work. Now we can go over to exit and hit save changes and exit. With all that done, you're now ready to download and enjoy some games. I hope that guide was helpful or entertaining for some of you. With that done, it's now time to talk about performance. I tested this system in a few games and in streaming. I may test more games and upload the gameplay of the tests and link them in a pinned comment, so if that's something you're interested in, let me know what games to test in the comments below. I tested all these games at 1440p. Starting out with the ever popular COD Warzone, I tested at 1440p high settings and received an average just above 100 FPS which is pretty good. I'm sure if you lowered the settings you could get 1440p 144Hz which would be an amazing experience. With this being said, the experience at 1440p high with 100 FPS was very smooth and enjoyable. Moving on to Fortnite at 1440p Pro settings, the system stayed in the low to mid 200s most of the time. This is well above the 144 FPS sweet spot and shows that this system is pretty overkill for Fortnite. Moving on to Doom Eternal, I tested at 1440p Ultra settings. I saw an average in the mid 100s which was very smooth and nice to see a modern AAA title running at 1440p 144Hz on this machine. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider which used the built in benchmark at 1440p high settings. This resulted in a 99 FPS average which is pretty respectable in my opinion. Finally let's talk about Borderlands 3 which was the lowest performance wise out of all the games tested. Using the built in benchmark at 1440p high settings, the system received a 72 FPS average which is a good step above 60 FPS, but I would have liked to see it at 100 FPS or more. Overall, gaming performance on this system is great. AAA 1440p gaming at 100 plus FPS is definitely possible by adjusting the settings and 1440p 144Hz competitive gaming is also possible on most esports titles. So now let's talk about streaming. I tested streaming at 1080p 60fps with a bitrate of 6000 kilobytes per second. I tested both Fortnite and COD Warzone, both of which ran great on both the stream and gameplay side of things. I played at 1080p with a locked 144fps to keep things consistent and in both cases the system stayed at the locked frame rate the majority of the time. Overall for gaming and streaming the system is a beast. You may want to upgrade a few things like the RAM and CPU if you want to do heavy 4K editing, but even in its current Current configuration it will still edit videos very well especially in 1080p and for basic 4k editing. All in all I'm very happy with how this system turned out and I think it's a pretty good way of allocating a $1250 budget. If you guys would have done things different let me know what parts you would have picked in the comment section below. These build guides are a lot of work but if you guys keep watching them then I'll keep making them. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.